Two, three, I don't know when it started, but probably stopped at about age four. A female relative sexually uh, abused me. I was 12 years old, the summer when I was 12. I was in my backyard and I wanted to kill myself. And I said to her, you know, if you don't listen to me, when this is all done, we'll still be married, but you won't know who I am. How could they have been happy doing those awful things they did? And I don't know how to say this, except for the first time I felt compassion for them, which I think God gave me. Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm Jonathan Darty, your host for today's program. Today's guest is a man who was sexually abused from the age of two or three, first by a woman, then by a man. But it wasn't until he married that memories of what had happened to him began to re-enter his consciousness. His name is Cecil Murphy. Now a New York Times best-selling author, Cecil is here to talk about his book, When a Man You Love Was Abused, A Woman's Guide to Helping Him Overcome Childhood Sexual Molestation. It's rare to find someone who can so accurately describe the inner feelings of a male who has been sexually abused. So this program is for both the abuse survivor and the woman he has married. As the rest of us, we need to pay close attention as well, because that male abuse victim just may be a close friend. So listen carefully as Cecil helps us understand how to be a friend or spouse of a sexually abused man. I don't know when it started, but probably stopped at about age four. A female relative sexually uh, abused me, you know, fondling, kissing my genitals, all those kinds of things just have those very, very vague memories. And I have three sisters who later confirmed that that was probably true from things they knew. Uh, about the same time, my father began to beat me a lot. You know, I'm, I'm the fifth of seven children. And one of the things we know about physical abuse is that usually the abusive parent usually will pick on one child or two. Well, I have a brother who's about 10 years older than I am. He got it and then I, I took his place and I started getting, got a lot of beatings. And that's important to this story because uh, I remember very distinctly deciding I would not let my father see me cry. I would never let him know that he was hurting me. And, and we just have that inability to, to focus ourselves outside of our, our world. And uh, I felt no pain that helped me then. As an adult, it was very painful, because, very difficult because um, I didn't feel when I should have or wanted to. But anyway, that stopped at about age four with my, with my uh, female relative. The, uh, my dad continued beating me till I was probably 11, maybe 12. Um, the second abuse took place when I was somewhere between age five and six. We can pinpoint that because we had just moved to Iowa uh, when I was about five and a half. And I don't know if it was right then or shortly after, we rented a room to an elderly man to help pay our rent. And, um, he would invite me and my older sister into his room. Um, and would, what I remember to, uh, mainly is that he would give me salting crackers with raspberry jam on top of them. We were hungry, poor kids. So you know, we went in there. And the one thing I remember most distinctively, he'd have me sit on his lap, put his arm around me, kind of hold me and you know, stroke me a little bit. And uh, then he'd let me eat my salting uh, and then uh, uh, he had these undershirts without the sleeves, and he would take my hand, and it was very hairy chest, bald. I remember he was bald, hairy chest, and so he just put my hand on his chest and just had, had me play with his hair, and, you know, and then progress from there. I don't remember all the details of that. I just remember that was where it began. And one of my sisters told me that shortly after that began, I told my sister, don't go in that room, it's not, it's not a good room for you, but she went in anyway. The female relative I mentioned, I said it stopped at least overtly, but I was probably, oh, 14, 15 before she totally stopped in that after I got a certain age, she never physically uh, abused me that way, but what she would do, she'd come in and she'd hug me and she would just throw her whole body into mine uh, in a very uncomfortable way. Even as a kid, I figured that out. And it really bothered me. But worse, 
she would tell me explicitly sexual jokes. Unfortunately, I remember some of them today. And she'd laugh and say, do you know what that means? That, I didn't even understand that. Well, of course she knew what it meant. And she was acting like very, very innocent about it. Uh, so that's basically my abuse story. Um, my father stopped beating me about 12. But abuse from the female relative stopped at about 13, 14, somewhere in there. Uh, but like a lot of other people, I had no memories of any of that. I can, only, my first childhood memory at, until I was 51 was I was... 12 years old, the summer when I was 12, I was in my backyard and I wanted to kill myself. And, and that was always was so strange to me because when people say to me, what kind of a childhood did you have? I would say, oh, you know, happy, conventional, uh, affectionate mother, taciturn father, you know, things like that. Because I really didn't remember, but that's how I said it. I was a pastor for 14 years and a missionary before that. And uh, one day I was running uh, about a 12 mile run. I was fine until about the end of uh, the 11th mile, and I began to cry. Now, that doesn't sound like much, except I hadn't cried for 40 years. And it wasn't just crying. I mean, it was convulsive. I could hardly continue my run. Uh, but I, got, I finally got home. Uh, I couldn't understand what was going on. And just and not only with the tears, but there was these vague memories, just kind of things I didn't want to accept about this female relative. They were starting to unravel in my head. And I've never talked to anybody. I've never talked to a therapist. So this is all totally spontaneous. No false memory kind of thing implanted. And um, I called my best friend who came over. Uh, he, and now he is a therapist. And he told me later he thought there might be something, but he never, ever opened the door. He always felt that there was, the door was to open. Uh, I would open it. But he, we never he never practiced therapy on me. Uh, but he came in looked at me, he could just see I was just wailing. And he, he's a big guy, much taller than I'm, big, broad fellow. And he just held out his arms and grabbed me and just let me put my head on his shoulder and I cried. I, I don't know how long, half an hour, 20 minutes, I don't know. But I finally calmed down and he said to me, you okay now? And I said, I think so. So he left me. Uh, he asked if it was okay to go and I said, yeah, sure, I'm fine. And I did calm down. I called my wife who was at work. I, uh, but I didn't tell her anything. I just said, I just see how you're doing. And uh, I, I said, something come up when you talk about it tonight. Nope. And, and so when she came in, I, I just really unloaded. Now my wife is one of those, what I call a cradle Christian. She doesn't know what it's like not to be a believer and very devout family. And so I didn't know how she was going to respond to this. But she, and I came from a totally non-Christian family. At the time, I of my conversion at, at age 21, I was the first one in my family to become a believer. So that's kind of family came in front. Since then, they've all become believers. Um, I, told her my, I told her what had happened to crying and the memories were starting to come back. And she said to me, you know, I don't understand this, but, but I love you and I'm, I'm here to help you, be with you, whatever you need. And that's all I needed from her, um, just the fact that she was there. And so after that, Every day uh, when she came home, we'd sit and have a cup of tea together and just talk. A lot of days I had new memories, not every day, but we talked and processed this. And I remember one time I thought she was getting tired of it. And I said to her, you know, if you don't listen to me, when this is all done, we'll still be married, but you won't know who I am. And she said, I, I, I want to listen. I want to know. I want to go on this journey with you. And I think I needed that more assurance than anything else. Uh, so, uh, you know, that began the process and slowly the memories returned. And finally, uh, after four or five years, I did call one of my sisters, the one who was abused, and started talking about a man, an old man named Mr. Lee. And she said, oh, I'd forgotten that. I could tell from her voice that she hadn't really forgotten. And we started talking, she confirmed all these memories that had suddenly come. And then I talked about the female relative and she said, oh yeah, she said, you don't know, but she was, she was abused by her father. So then it made, began to make sense. Bad, I felt there was something wrong with me. The way I say it is, I, I felt bad, but what really, the truth was something bad was done to me. And I never had any sense of being worthwhile, which I think is very common uh, in men who are sexually assaulted. We feel kind of worthless. 
Trust was another really big issue. Um, I vacillate on the trust question. Sometimes I'd find somebody and I would be so distrustful, I, I, I couldn't hear a word they would say. I wouldn't believe a word they said. I was such a skeptic. Or I'd go the other way and I would just open my arms and, and then let them, you know, trust them with anything. The worst thing for me is that I was numb. When I when was overwhelmed with feelings, instead of de- being able to deal with them, I just, it was like I was frozen inside. And I later realized this is typical of other men, but I couldn't understand it. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, one time my wife and I were in a bottle in a head-on collision, and they kept her in the emergency room, and they told me that she probably would not survive the night. She, she did. She had a wonderful, wonderful healing experience that the doctors cannot explain and for which we were grateful. But I stood there in front of her gurney. And this is the person I loved most of my whole life. And I could feel nothing. Just nothing. And I kept thinking, God, what's wrong with me? Fortunately, over the years, I've slowly learned to feel in these very difficult, overwhelming times. But for, a lot, for, for many years, it was like I would just totally go numb. One of the problems with those of us who've been abused is somehow, and I don't, it's not a logical thing because emotions aren't logical, but we tend to take the blame on ourselves as though we've caused it. And sometimes the perpetrators say to the the, uh, people they've abused, uh, uh, you enticed me, or if if you hadn't been so needy, or I had a really handsome friend who said to me, they used to tell me, if you hadn't been so good looking, I never would have come after you. And so those are excuses the perpetrators use. Um, And I I don't know why we do it, except that I guess we do. And we live in this, we're children in this adult world. And the tendency for us when we're children is that something goes wrong, we did it. And I think that's just a kind of a natural reaction in childhood. And trouble is, we don't always outgrow that. Shame is a big issue. I, as I thought about my childhood, why I never told, my sister told about the old man who abused her, my, and my dad beat the man up and threw him out, but I never said a word. Uh, and I thought about that many times, and I think it, it was that I was so ashamed. And I, I'd, already, you know, I'd already begun to realize uh, by the age of five or six, the boys reacted different to, than, differently than girls did. Boys were supposed to be tough and manly, and we, there were certain things we couldn't play. We couldn't play with paper dolls or a jump rope. Those were girly things. Uh, and I, I think that had already begun to work in me. Uh, and and there, there was this terrible sense of shame. And I don't know if, if, I don't know if they would believe me. See, I never felt loved by either one of my parents. So I'm not sure at that age that I, would, that I thought they would even care. When I was a teenager, I was still feeling so different and odd, and, and I was always this crazy place. I really liked girls, and yet I would feel this attraction toward uh, men, especially men who paid any attention to me. Uh, and I actually tried uh, a homosexual experience once, and it was, it was so awful, I just vomited. I, I vomited, and for two or three days, all I could do was just get sick in my stomach and feel awful about it. So I, I realized that wasn't who I was. Uh, see, I, I just learned about the word homosexual with those men. I thought, well, maybe that's who I am. But I, I realized I just wasn't made that way. Uh, when I, and nothing much happened. I lived a fairly conventional life, uh, involved in career and family and so on. But when the memory started coming back at age 51, these were the drastic changes in my life. It was like, who am I? I have no idea who I really am. I don't know how I feel about things. I don't know what I want. Well, fortunately, my best friend and my wife were there to encourage me. And, you know, these memories were coming back, but I was afraid of them. I thought, maybe, what if I'm, what if I'm lying to myself? This was before I even knew about the false memory syndrome. I thought, am I just making this stuff up? But there was just so much proof that I knew I wasn't doing that. So slowly I started to accept these memories and let them come back. And I had a recurring dream uh, that I can't, you know, I can't remember when it started. I can't it was there forever or it seemed like. Uh, and in this dream, I would went to the house in which we lived. 
It was an old white building. It had once been a duplex, and there were five steps up, and on one door on either side was a mailbox. In this dream, I would walk up the steps, and sometimes you'd be a letter on one side, sometimes a letter on the other side, sometimes no letters, but I would open the door and start to go in every time the dream would end. Uh, after I started getting in touch with those memories and remembering things, I had a dream. Same way I started, except I got inside the building, the house. But I could only see from about the waist down of everybody there, and I went from room to room, and I finally realized, well, of course, I was a child. That's, that's all I could see. But I went through the whole house, and I had some hiding places that I would hide to, uh, to get away, especially my father. My father was an alcoholic, uh, and, which is probably the reason he beat me, and I could hide from him. Uh, but it was like that was my liberation. I've never had the dream since then. I went through the whole house, it was clear. And I felt that God was giving me that dream to say, you are being healed. And so it's been a prog progressive thing for me over the years. Uh, I keep learning uh, about these things and the effects that the, the, the abuse uh, have had on me. Uh, that's probably where my cutting edge is still. Learning things about myself that I, I finally can connect with, with the abuse. Some people do go into the gay lifestyle and, and stay in it, some come out of it. We have all kinds of, we all react differently. One of the outcomes that many of us have is what we call same-sex attraction, or people don't talk about it very much. It isn't that we have to act on it, but it's just there, and I think that's part of the pattern of the abuse. Particularly those of us who were abused by males, I think that fear is always that we might be homosexual ourselves, and it was certainly there for, with me for a long, long time. Even after that bad experience, every once in a while the doubt would be there. But I, by then I'd become a believer, and I won't say I had this marvelous deliverance, but I did feel the grace of God at, at work in my life. Many of the men I know who are abused become promiscuous, either male with other males, with females, uh, and, and, I, and I don't know what the percentage is of those who become perpetrators, uh, but I know there are quite a few of them. I don't think it's automatic. Um, I just know that when we're damaged, we were innocent kids and our psyche, our spirit was damaged. And somebody did something terrible to bend us out of shape. And because we're bent out of shape, we might go in any direction. I really honestly think that's much more damaging when it's a female who abuses us than, than, than a male. It's one we don't talk about but I, as much. But I think it also distorts your whole view of women. Uh, when I met my wife, um, she was this virginally pure person. I knew it, but somewhere I was always suspicious that she really had been sleeping around and uh, you know, had all those kinds of, of, of experiences. And even though emotionally I knew that wasn't true, there was a terrible questioning and doubting of her. And, you know, she had to prove to me, she didn't realize it, but she had to prove to me that she was trustworthy. Once I began to get in touch with my abuse, of course I prayed. And one of the first things that I, I really felt I had to do was to forgive my perpetrators. And that was not easy. Now, they were both dead. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm glad for that because I never had to worry about facing them. But uh, I still had this anger, intense anger toward both of them. And so uh, my method was every single day, I prayed for God to enable me to forgive my perpetrators. And here's what finally happened to me. One day, I, I, there was this moment of insight, and I thought, wait a minute, what miserable people they must be. They were abusive. They took advantage of innocent children. They couldn't be happy people. How? And they were both dead, of course, but how could they have been happy doing those awful things they did? And I don't know how to say this, except for the first time I felt compassion for them, which I think God gave me. And I was able to finally lay it aside and forgive them and thinking, you know, they were probably victims themselves, and they were only acting out of their victimization. They need my compassion and not my anger. And, you know, it just, the anger just kind of dissolved. Um, 
I don't think that's typical of most men. I think most men, it takes a much, much longer to forgive their perpetrators. Uh, but as far as God is concerned, uh, every day, uh, again, a couple of things I prayed. Uh, you know, I'd have, it was from time to time, the same sex attraction would be there. So every day I would just say, God, make me a healthy heterosexual male. And, you know, just, just I prayed probably every day for 10 years. And I won't say it just vanished. I can only say that over a period of 10 years, it diminished so much that I'm, it almost never happens anymore. I mean, it's just rare. Um, and I did, it wasn't that I was acting on it. Uh, it's, it's like being tempted, but it has no power over you. And that's, that's how I felt. I think one of the reasons I was uh, a victim of childhood abuse is because I was this terribly, terribly needy kid who didn't feel loved, didn't feel wanted. Um, and uh, so I was, any, any perpetrator probably could have uh, abused me. And I think what really happened to me after <laughs> maybe 20 years of marriage, I finally knew my wife loved me just for who I was and not because I was a nice guy or because I did think what she did and my best friend David they taught me what it really meant to be loved without reservation here's how it happened with David my best friend one day I was telling him a very shameful story about the time I had this uh, 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 homosexual encounter and I was so ashamed and yet I felt like it was time to tell him. And I told him, <clears throat> and he was sitting there listening, and, and finally he said, and? I said, what do you mean, and? He said, well, what happened next? I said, David, that's it. He said, oh. Now, that doesn't sound like much, perhaps, but it was that, oh. It's like, okay, no big deal, I got it. Nobody ever done that for me. See, I'd always envisioned if somebody really knew who I was, they would hate me, despise me, kick me out, you know, all that kind of stuff. And my wife and my best friend, they gave me this wonderful sense of being accepted and loved. And I think this is the one need all of us have. And, and you know, I can honestly tell you, I, I, for a long time, theologically, intellectually, I knew God loved me, but emotionally, I felt I was a bunch of, I was just trash. But because of the love of these two people, day after day, year after year, I finally was able to accept that I'm lovable just because of who I am. And it's not what I do, it's who I am. And that's what has meant so much to me. If you're a man and you were abused, remember this, you are not bad. Something bad, something terrible was done to you. It totally distorted your life. What I would hope you would see is that God loves you just as you are. And you may not be able to talk about it, but it's so important for you to break the silence. You can trust. Find someone to whom you can talk and begin to open the door. If you're a man who has suffered sexual abuse at the hands of a man or woman, I want you to know that there is healing for your soul. You don't have to live in the anger, fear, and hatred anymore. It is our heartfelt prayer that God will make you whole again through our Lord Jesus Christ. Until next week, I'm Jonathan Darty for Pure Passion.